Welcome to the Fretboard Journal podcast. I am your host, Jason Verlindi. Do me a favor. If you love this show, if you love these interviews that we do with not only incredible musicians, but also incredible musical instrument makers, go onto your social media feed or however you share things with your friends these days and tell them about this show. Maybe pick an episode out that particularly resonated with you. Tell them to go check it out. Finding new podcasts is so hard and daunting, and there is no great search recommendation engine that I've ever found. You just kind of stumble upon shows. Next thing you know, you're listening to them every week. Tell your friends about this show. It'll help it grow. I will uh, give you my gratitude for the rest of my life. And uh, at the end of the day, we'll have an even stronger podcast if more and more people are listening to it. So on the podcast today, I'm talking to someone who is no stranger to the Fretboard Journal. We've celebrated him and his music many times. He's one of the great acoustic instrumentalists of our time, Joe K. Walsh. Joe is an educator at Berkeley. He is also a performer. You may have seen him alongside Daryl Anger and Mr. Sun. You may have seen him alongside Grant Gordy, the incredible guitarist he's collaborated with forever. On our website, they also performed at the 2016 Fretboard Summit. We love everything Joe is up to, and he just put out a record called If Not Now Who that is just thoroughly beautiful. If you love the Punch Brothers, if you love Bela Fleck's Bluegrass Side, you are going to want to hear this record. It's kind of the perfect soundtrack for a rainy weekend morning when you've got a nice pot of coffee. It's beautiful. It's complex. There's a lot going on. The playing is just astounding. I thoroughly love this record. I hope you'll check it out. And I wanted to hear all about it. So that is the conversation you're going to hear with Joe. We talk about the making of the record, talk about what Joe's up to. We talk about the gear on the record and a lot more. It's a fun chat. I think you're going to love it. Here in Seattle at the Fretboard Journal World Headquarters, things are buzzing. We are plotting our next Fretboard Summit, which is taking place August 24th to 26th, 2023 at Chicago's Old Town School of Folk Music. Hit me up if you have any incredible programming ideas or thoughts about the summit. Maybe you attended one of the first ones we've done. Uh, podcast at fretboardjournal.com is the easiest way to get a hold of me. We are also busy shipping out this book that our friends Dick Boak and Michael Gurian compiled. It's a book of stories from fellow guitar makers and repair people called An Instrument Maker's Guide to Insanity and Redemption. This book is flying off the shelves. I wasn't <laughs> expecting it, but uh, the uh, the mail gun and the postage meter is uh, smoking right now because so many of you have ordered it. Keep those orders coming in. And of course, the Fretboard Journal's 51st issue is out now, so if anybody wants to check out that issue, Scott Napier, another mandolin player, wrote in it. Derek Trucks is in there, Jeff Tweedy, uh, Franklin Guitar Company, a lot of great stories. A feature on the mid-70s gear of Jerry Garcia. Lots of surprises in this issue. A lot of folks are saying it's their favorite Fretboard Journal issue yet, which I truly, truly appreciate. And the way to get that issue is to head on over to fretboardjournal.com and to click on the subscribe button. We can still start you off with that issue if you have not seen the magazine yet. We also have discounted PDF subscriptions for those of you who want to lead a minimalist life with as little paper as possible. Uh, what else can I tell you? Stay tuned to fretboardjournal.com. We have a whole bunch of new videos hitting our site very soon. We just did a video shoot with Jake Eddy that we're going to be posting in the next week or so. And what else can I tell you? There's so much going on. I can't even keep track. Just trust me when I say stay tuned to the podcast, follow our email newsletter. I'll give you all the insights and details on everything we are producing and creating this uh, January, February of 2023. And there are lots of great updates. Speaking of updates, a uh, great segue here. Our friends at Retrofrit Vintage Guitars are sponsoring the podcast once again. And once again, I head on over to their website and I see some of the coolest instruments, 
known to mankind on their just arrived page, including they have a 1910 Lion and Healy Chase flat top guitar, a little parlor guitar made by Lion Healy, 115 years old almost. Uh, that is on their site right now. They've got a Burns Baldwin Marvin, beautiful guitar, a Gibson L00 from 1933, the tuxedo finish, and so much more. Go to retrofret.com. Tell them the Fretboard Journal sent you. It's my favorite thing to do all week. I love looking at their new arrivals page. We are also brought to you by our friends at Peghead Nation. And a great reminder, Joe K. Walsh is one of their marquee instructors. He teaches uh, bluegrass mandolin jam favorites. He teaches octave mandolin. He teaches improvising for mandolin and fiddle and I think a couple other things. If you want to check out Peghead Nation, go to their site. Use the promo code FRETBOARD when you check out. You're going to get your first month free or $20 off of any annual subscription. Those are our big announcements. Again, thanks to everybody who listens to this show. It really means the world to me. And uh, thanks for keeping the feedback coming. Podcast at FRETBOARDJournal.com is how you can reach out to me for this show or any of the other podcasts that we put out. And without further ado, here is my conversation with the one and only Joe K. Walsh. I hope you enjoy it. Joe, how are you? I'm doing good. Yeah. Good. Good morale at the moment. Uh, well, you should feel good because you just put out an incredible record that I've known about for a few months. We're finally talking about it. It's called If Not Now Who? And uh, I mean, it's thoroughly beautiful. Uh, can you Can you share a little bit of the story behind this record? Sure. Yeah. Well, I just appreciate you checking it out. It's, it's, you know, this music is stuff I've been living with for uh, a few years and, and it's nice to know that it's out there in people's ears and getting a soft landing. Um, I, I, you know, being a mandolin player, um, there's all these expectations of what you're supposed to play stylistically material, what kind of material. And I, it, it came to, you know, I, I started paying attention to, there was a little bit of a gulf between what I actually listened to and what I play, I think, you know, and, and this was kind of an intent. Uh, the, in, the intention here was to try and get a lot closer to what I actually listen to, which would be, you know, at home. I love conversational records where people listen to each other and then make decisions. And, and that's not always a given on lots of records. And, and that was the intention here to try and get some people together that whose biggest value is just listening to each other and, uh, and then, and then responding and, and making something that none of us could have made by ourselves. I love that. And I, and I wanted to ask you about that because I remember on your Instagram, you mentioned the conversational aspect of the record. But, but one thing that I was curious about, I was reading your band camp and you, know, you kind of do a little track by track listing, a little, a little hint at what, you know, either how the song came to be or what it's about. Does, did the found, are you just constantly you know, composing to a certain degree and trying to write new tunes on the mandolin? Because it seems like, you know, your car broke down and you wrote a great tune about it. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, I'm basically trying to write all the time. And like, to me, it's a numbers game. And, and I write a lot of stuff that doesn't see the light of day and it's crap, really. <laughs> and then I, hopefully I can tell the difference. Um, uh, and then to me, it's like, pick up the mandolin, see if there's any seed sitting there. And if not, go back to my usual, you know, practice routine or whatever I'm preparing for the gig. So, yeah, definitely always writing and then always accumulating little recordings. And then a lot of times when I'm driving, like back from a gig, I might check in on a on a on a seed that I started earlier in the week and then just see what might come to mind. Do those seeds usually start out in your head, like with a, a melody that you then try to put into the mandolin or do they start out just noodling and then it's like, whoa, that sounded kind of cool. Yeah. I think the latter, I think it's important. You know, I, I think sometimes you can find, or I can find that I'm not actually listening. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and so to me, like whenever I can actually listen and say, Oh, okay, this part's boring me or this part has a beautiful aspect of freshness. And then just trying to, you know, cultivate that and see where, where that can lead. So. Mm -hmm. I love the idea of writing without the mandolin. And sometimes that happens. And I know that Reisman will do that. Um, and I think like it's a good way to send, send a send us you know to try and avoid the whole uh, fingers making the decisions for you melodically, which I think is a real trap. Yeah. So that what does that look like for him and and for you when you try to do it? Just literally writing out the notes, or uh, I think just getting a melody in, in head and yeah. then and, and then 
once it's in head and you can sing it, then and finding it on the instrument instead of vice versa. Mm-hmm. I don't really want to seed my head in that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you wrote this. You wrote the kernels of this album in a variety of settings, obviously, but you wanted to make a, a conversational album. When you finally went into the recording studio, how much foundation was there? Uh, I mean, did you just book a recording studio for like a month and see what happened? Like, how did this go down? It's a funny question because because I used to really want to leave everything open to to leave space for all my collaborators, and, and I felt like. In a sense, if I showed up with every decision being already having been made, nobody could have room for their own personality. But then also, I'm not trying to offload the whole concept of what should happen and what is the arrangement. You know, that's not really fair. So there's a balance to be struck there. So basically, I showed up with, you know, tunes and, and ideas of everything that could go and then and then open an open mind, um, especially given... The people, you know, I hire people that I just have this just huge, deep trust in, and they're all really beautiful musicians. So I think if I entered that room with the presumption that I already had it all cracked and, and they wouldn't have a beautiful thing to bring to it, I, that would be just really foolish. Yeah. When when did you actually record this record? Thanksgiving, um, uh, a year past, this, this past Thanksgiving. Okay. It's 2021. Yeah. Yeah. And so did you, you obviously had a finite amount of time. You booked a studio for how long? I think we were there three days, four days. Okay. I, you know, I don't know, even know how, like you, you read about bands that were in a studio for a month. I don't, I've never understood how that happens. Like, <laughs> I don't, <laughs> when, one of my favorite records I made was that Daryl Anger, Eanda record. And through a couple of miscommunications, he had booked Anyways, the, we, the, the amount of time he booked included time where people were flying home. So we ended up having like two days and we just did it. And there was no time for that great, you know, uh, self-questioning part of the process. It was just like commitment and, and it led to some beautiful things. So I, I, I don't mind the whole short time frame thing. Yeah. And everybody was in the room at the same time, it sounds like, to... To make it conversational. Part. Yeah. 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 It, it was really, really important um, that it was all live. Um, yeah. I didn't want to do a COVID, here's the track, you respond and mail it back record. I didn't, I didn't think that was what this was about. Yeah. I don't even, uh, I, I'm forgetting where the studio is. I, I know you're in Portland, Maine, but where is the studio? And is it, what's, are a lot of great records recorded there? I don't, it hasn't been on my radar. Yeah. It's, well, it's in, <laughs> It's outside of Parson Field, Maine, so it's okay. fair that it's not on your radar. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's just a nondescript white farmhouse out there, but um, uh, one of the fellows from Josh Ritter's band bought it and then basically set up a studio. So they make Josh Ritter's made records, I think. Okay. Um, Lake Street Dive did a couple records, Joy Kill Sorrow. It's kind of become this beautiful place where you can just, you know, you don't even get phone service out there, so you can just go be there for a few days and really focus that sounds amazing. And and do you stay in the studio? Like, you know, yeah, it's a compound. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That sounds great. So, I mean, you gave yourself a few days, but, um, these were kind of, uh, back and forth conversational tracks, compositions. So did you ever run out of time? <laughs> Was the conversation just getting going and you had to move on to the next track? Yeah. Uh, well, some things, I don't know, you just come in with some ideas and then some things just didn't work and, and just had to acknowledge that. And then maybe they'll show up in another record down the line. I, I feel like it's all just so situational but with how somebody's feeling on a given day, the emotions in that room. I don't know. Sometimes, like I was saying this to somebody the other day, like some of these tunes I wrote and got to try and vote first with that trio you saw, Danny, Barnes, and Grant. And that was such a funny thing because like they'll make everything sound good so it was like you never really know if it's a good tune because they're just so damn musical but i don't know I, some of these tunes i like that ended up getting cut i have a lot of faith in but it was just they didn't gel that day i think got it yeah and you have matt flinner on the album who is i mean both he and danny are amazing but they're kind of polar opposites in the world of banjo <laughs> at least from the you outside <laughs> you know yeah, tell me more <laughs> Uh, don't put me on the spot. I mean, Danny, <laughs> Danny is like the um, avant-garde punk musician who who makes beautiful records, whereas Matt 
you know, starts out pretty and gets wilder. I don't know. That's it's, funny. I don't know. You know what I see is a commonality between them is that they both. I don't. I don't see here them resorting to licks. It's always um, chasing a, an idea that's in the head, and then um, you know choosing to play that. And it never feels like um, uh, for, for you know. Sometimes in bluegrass, it can be the idea is we're finding a way to get to fireworks, mm-hmm. and it never really felt like that with them. It always yeah. felt like like I love Danny's thing about sometimes we'd do a gig and we'd start the gig with the quietest tune of the evening. Mm. And and maybe it's a brand new tune, and he's he just seems fearless about his commitment to understatement and and leaving space, and and that was really inspiring. I bet, I bet. And he had drums on this record. I had drums. Yeah, there was a couple of tunes that felt like. Um, well, again, there's that gulf between what you're listening to and what you're playing, and a lot of times I'm listening to Fre- Frizzell records or Schofield records, and and. Um, I wanted to explore the idea of what, how much I could not play, how much less I could play if there were drums. You know what I mean? <laughs> totally. <laughs> What's the answer to that? How much less can you play? It's real nice. It's real great. I, I feel like um, when when there's when it's a given that the groove and the drive is still being maintained, it opens up such beautiful possibilities. Yeah. And you speaking of. Frizzell, you you have a track that uh, is an homage to both Bill Monroe and Bill Frizzell um, called The Bills. And uh, it says you co-wrote that with Andrew Marlin. Yeah. With Watchtower. Like, ta- how did that come to be? Well, some of these tunes, uh, like, I, like I said, I'll write the first bit. And, and this was one of these tunes where I had written the A section and um, it was kind of lurking for a year or two. And even Daryl and I had tried to write the B part. Um, but never really... S- gelled and, and then I just mailed the A part or you know texted the A part to Andrew and he sent the B part right back um, yeah it's it's interesting it was nice to have like a whole t- another perspective he's I, he's one of my favorite tune writers and I don't think we think about things at all in a similar in the same way so it's mm-hmm. kind of it's really cool to have just an absolutely different perspective on the same tune yeah uh, what what was your I know you played a, f- a few different uh mandolin sizes mandolin family instruments on this on this album what what did you play so actually i bought um, a gilchrist uh andrew's old gilchrist f5 congratulations yeah i think you guys wrote it up in in your magazine yeah yeah there's a nice picture of that but um that's a really special mandolin and i've been basically just committed to playing that for the last few years and um some of these tunes were written on on the mandola and the octave mandolin. So I played uh, those on the instrument or on the record as well. So I have a Lawrence Smart mandola, which I think is really beautiful. Lawrence is a beautiful builder, yeah. especially for the mandola uh, uh, instruments. And then this was a Fletcher Brock uh, octave mandolin. Nice. Yeah. It's amazing. Uh, are you still doing a lot of teaching? I'm down at Berkeley a day and a half a week. So What's yeah. that commute look like? It's not crazy. Well, everybody has a different definition of crazy, right? But it's a, a hour and 45 to Boston, and then I usually stay over and then come back. Okay. And what's your, uh, what are you teaching like this semester? There's, come, of course, a bunch of private lessons, and then I usually have two ensembles. And um, one of them is the tune writing ensemble, which to me, whenever there's a semester that where that's happening, that's one of my favorite things. Um, it, it like when everybody has each other's back and everybody um, makes it clear they have faith in each other and mm-hmm. it, you know you make it feel like it's a safe place, um, it's a really beautiful thing where everybody, each of the students and me, each bring in a new tune every Monday and and it's, you can sort of test out if it's working. You can actually some of the some of the ways these tunes on the record came to to, to life was in this class and like for example, the last tune I had written it, but there was one moment where. I knew what the melody was, but I didn't know what the last chord was supposed to be. Um, and I brought it in and just opened it up. And, and Minnie Jordan, who's a tremendous fiddle player, she just had the most uh, perfect chord for that one moment. It's sort of like the punchline that I was looking for. And, and so it was a nice way to co-write and bring something to life. And kind of the same thing. It's like uh, if we can make it clear that uh, as a teacher, even, you're not supposed to it shouldn't be presumed that I know everything and that I'm supposed to show up, show up 
there should be space for not knowing. And that should yeah. be part of the process. God, that, sound, that class sounds fascinating. I mean, people bring in every week a fragment or maybe a fully fleshed out composition and then everyone hears it and, and riffs on it? Yeah, yeah. Basically, everybody's like, here brings in a chart and they're like, here's the vibe. I want this feel. Um, we play it down a couple times and then somebody's saying, well, uh, maybe I thought the B part was going to work this way, but maybe this chord doesn't work. And then somebody might say, well, have you thought about this? Or it's, it's really, you know, again, when it's, it's really delicate. Cause if, if somebody <laughs> is, is, if anybody feels that they don't, you know, you don't have their back, then it, it, it's a lot harder. But when everybody's really there for each other, it's a beautiful thing. That's gotta be totally inspiring. I hope so. It is for me. <laughs> yeah. How has your role as a professor, teacher, what do you call yourself? Teacher's good, yeah. Teacher. <laughs> yeah. How has that role changed the more you do it? Like, are you, uh, have you learned a lot over the years teaching at yeah. Berkeley? Yeah. I think, I mean, I think a lot of it is whether it's being a creative musician or being a teacher, uh, learning to accept the thing that you do and the thing that you offer and uh, accepting that it doesn't have to be like, again, like with the mandolin, there's so many expectations. Like you're supposed to play like this and this style of tune, or you're supposed to play this type of tune, or you're supposed to know this vocabulary and, and gradually, um, being okay with moving away from that. And then the same is true at Berkeley. Like Berkeley is such a, you know, there's so many presumptions about what happens at Berkeley mm -hmm. and it's easy to be influenced by, those presumptions. And then gradually you could say, well, Bruce Molsky is over here teaching, uh, you know, these old time tunes. And that's a beautiful part of the conversation here. And, um, I, I think it's just gotten easier to accept that and, and understand that what value is being added, even if, you know, we're not transcribing Coltrane solos on the mandolin, say. Yeah. Yeah. You, you are up in Portland, Maine, like we said. Uh, your band seems to be scattered about. Have you guys been able to play together outside of the recording studio much as a, a full unit? Not once. <laughs> 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 but we're doing a tour uh, this month. Um, I feel like, I, again, I have such faith and I've spent so much time playing with Grant Gordy. Yeah. And, and so we have such rapport and... and, and, and um, same is true with Daryl Langer is going to be on the tour. So it's going to be one day of rehearsal. Um, and again, with Brittany Carlson, she's the bass player and, and, and just like a lot of history there and the drummer, John Sunkin. So it's like, I feel like we could just show up at the gig and it would be a beautiful thing, but we have the luxury of a, a, a day of rehearsal. <laughs> that's good. You've given yourself that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing about improvising music, right? Like, uh, with Mr. Sun, as some of y'all, your listeners might mm -hmm. know, is a band I had with Grant and Daryl and uh, Aiden O'Donnell. And, and people, the most often question is people are like, well, one of y'all lives in Nashville, one of y'all lives in Maine, the rest of y'all live in New York. How do you rehearse? And, and it's, with improvised music, it's so flexible and malleable that if somebody changes one note or, or even misses a section, we're all, we've all got our ears up and, and it's become that thing where we are each other's safety net and, I think the it, I finally got that place where I don't presume there's a correct way to play a tune. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that was a huge shift and a really important one. Like this happened this way this day and it could be good, but I don't need to presume that that's the way it should happen every day. Yeah. And, and I think that makes it possible when, uh, the band, whether it's Mr. Sun or in this case, this uh, CD release tour lives in many time zones and States. Like we're all showing up, uh, prepared to listen and, and respond. Are, I mean, I know you're you're a teacher of uh, composing, not this, but like, is there are there any other tips you would give people? You know, obviously, you've got a well oiled machine and this little mini army of people you've collaborated with over the years who you could do a gig with tomorrow without a rehearsal, and it would be great. But like, what are some tips for people who maybe are wanting to improvise? with a group for the first time, like besides the listening thing, what, what are yeah. some mistakes people make and what are the best traits you can have? Well, I think entering with the presumption that you're going to make a lot of mistakes mm -hmm. and that, and, and then seeing that as putting in the work, I think is really important. That's a big shift. I think people are so afraid of, 
um, not knowing which notes to avoid. And then I, I feel like just go in and get your hands dirty and, and then, and then gradually learn through that instead of this accepting that that's part of the process. And, and it's not a thing to berate yourself about, but actually something to, uh, you know, think of as putting in your time. That's a beauty. That's a, th- that's a really nice thing to, to commit to also finding people who share your aesthetic and, and, um, I, I, you know, moving to Maine, it's not like there's, you know, 25 banjo players to choose from. Um, <laughs> or, you know, there's not like, it's like a deep bench here. And, and my, when I first moved here, it was like, I wanted to put together a smoke and bluegrass band and you can do it, but you can't do it if anybody else has a gig that day, <laughs> you yeah. know, it, it quickly pokes a hole in that. Um, and so I got used to the idea of finding other people who like piano players. I never thought piano and mandolin was like, was, was a natural fit, but then I found people who shared the same improvising values. And, and that was a big shift too. So finding somebody who wants to improvise in the same way as you and maybe redefining what instrument that might be, could be mm-hmm. clarinet, could be whatever. When is the piano and mandolin album come out? Oh man, I'm excited. I'm actually working on one with, <laughs> with the great Jed Wilson. Oh, you are? Okay. Yeah. I don't know. He, he kind of dropped off the map a little bit, but he was this piano player with Aoife O'Donovan and Heather Massey and just such a beautiful, never plays a, like a one note too many. He's just such a perfect musician. So, so that, that could happen or yeah, will happen. It's right. happening. Okay. I love it. <laughs> What drew you to Maine? I mean, as you said earlier, before we started hitting record, like at the time there weren't as many musicians there, but like what drew you there? Well, I was in, so when I graduated from Berkeley, I was in Joy Kill Sorrow and, and a couple other bands that we were all working, yeah. but my partner at the time really hated Boston. And yeah. so we found another place that was close. And, and at the time, Portland was affordable. It was a cheap city and a beautiful city. And so I already had these touring gigs where I, got my musical needs met elsewhere and, and, and then I come back and walk around this beautiful city. So, and also I just never presumed I'd be here forever. And here I, here I am. <laughs> How long has it been? 15 years. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're a, a lifer for, I'm sure the, the old school Mainers who are like multi-generational consider yeah, yeah. you a tourist, exactly. but, but yeah. Yeah. I basically showed up yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> I get it. I get it for Maybe. sure. Going back to the record and and you um, trying to tap a little bit more into the albums that you you love and that have influenced you. Can you walk me through some of your favorite you know conversational acoustic albums? Or maybe they're not even acoustic. Like, what were there any kind of like Northern Stars that where you're like, I want to be kind of like that with this record? Well, well certainly, lots of Fritzell records. The Nashville record is is the most obvious example because it's yeah. acoustic in that way. Um, I think that record with, uh, um, Frizzell and Fred Hirsch is spectacular. That's yeah. so cool. Um, the record, um, that Frizzell did with Greg Cohen, which is actually under his name. I think it's called golden state. Mm-hmm. That's beautiful. Cause it's, it's, it doesn't feel like it has to be, um, full of jazz language in, in a, in a way somebody might perceive it. I like some of the tunes will feel more, um, accessible to a bluegrass or folk audience. Um, that's a cool record. Um, Keith Jarrett and Charlie Hayden record, um, Jasmine. Mm-hmm. That's so, so beautiful. And it really shifted my perceptions. Like there's times where they're not perfectly in sync, right? Like there's like in, in the bluegrass world, my experience, you're like, look, we felt the downbeat just slightly off from each other. And then I go listen to that record or that record, um, Charlie Hayden and Hank Jones to steal away. Oh yeah. That's one of the yeah, greats. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. But it's not like they're always feeling it perfectly hand in glove. And it really kind of forced me to think, well, maybe that's not my priority. Yeah. Maybe maybe that's not the, my greatest value in a record. And what they're doing, uh, does it, you know, it, it rises above that. And it's yeah. beautiful even with that. Yeah. You you and Grant have done Steal Away or it's a track from it, right? Yeah. 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 The, the, that Charlie Hayden tune, Spiritual. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Have you played with Frizzell yet? Um, nope. Got to change that. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so where's this uh, Where's this tour that you're about to embark on headed? 
we're going all over New England. Uh, it was kind of a, a gift that we could, I could even line up five days where everybody was free. I bet. And, yeah. So just trying to hit the spots up here. It would be lovely to go further and, and maybe there's a time where I could figure out a, a setting where I could bring it further across the country. But at the moment that was, that felt like a, re, a real victory. Are you doing much touring in 2023 outside of this group? Yeah. Mr. Sun's playing, um, Mr. Sun's playing a bunch. And then I'm also playing with the cello player, Mike Block, oh. um, and his trio, which features a, a great bass player. And that's fun. Um, I think that's most of it. Yeah. yeah. Mr. Sun's big project is we're all at home trying to digest, uh, the Nutcracker, uh, as it was played by Duke Ellington and his band. And then, trying to rearrange that for our string band. Um, so that's the big arc for us this year. <laughs> Is this a Christmas time release? <laughs> I guess it will be, right? <laughs> You're presuming that we, uh, that we have, you know, a plan. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm floored. I want to hear more. It should be fun. We'll see. That's whose idea was that? Well, that was, it was, it was my idea, but, uh, but it was also, it just, it plays to our strengths in a beautiful way. Everybody's so uh, interested in, in, in improvising in, you know, harmonically, harmonically complex ways, but it's also really playful. I don't know if you've heard that Ellington version of yeah. the Nutcracker. Yeah. It just felt like really in the spirit of, of Mr. Sun. So it kind of felt perfect for us. That sounds incredible. I, I we'll hope see. it happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're premiering at Fresh Grass, so it'll, it's, it's going to happen. <laughs> okay, good, good. It's not just an idea. No, no, we're committed <laughs> for yeah. better or for worse. Uh, the new album, if not now, who is that on vinyl too now? It's on vinyl, yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it showed up in time even. Uh, there's all those things where it's like you never really know when you with vinyl, but yeah, it's here. Congratulations. How's it sound? Sounds pretty good. Yeah. 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 Well, um, I, I love this record. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of just, I'll just keep flattering you. Like it's, it's one of the, I'm sure you've heard this from many, but I feel like it's, I know it's not a mandolin record, but it's like one of the best mandolin records I've heard in a long, long time. Oh man. Thank you. Thank you. I, I felt like, I feel like as a musician, we can sometimes just be at home um, complaining about the state of things, right? And and then it occurred to me, like, if I think there should be something else happening in the conversation with mandolin music, mm -hmm. if I think that there should be something, I should just, I should do that instead of just grousing, you know? Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's a really positive time. Like Simon, I feel like he's, Simon uh, Dunson is doing that in, in yeah. his own way. And um, Sierra, I think, is is so inspiring in, in the what she'll do and the risks she'll take, so... I felt like, yeah, instead of just grousing, I should commit to making something that I felt filled that space. It's yeah. I mean, it's really cool to just, you know, I know this has been going on for decades, but it's, it's really cool to just hear new compositions for mandolin because I feel like for a lot of us weekend warrior, you know, hacks, whatever you want to call the rest of us, the, the non Joe K Walsh's of the world. Um, you know, we spend so much time with a mandolin or an instrument, like trying to perfect an old fiddle tune or some standard. And we never even think, at least in my own view, like I never even think about trying to write music on my own. Whereas for guitar, I think a lot of people are used to, even if you only know three cowboy chords, you can kind of write a new song or something. So yeah, it's, sure. just, it's just nice to hear new mandolin music that's just like opens your eyes. I don't know. Well, I appreciate that. That's, that yeah, I just, I felt like it was important for there to be other option, other demonstrations of what's possible with the mandolin. Mm -hmm. And I think obviously, maybe you'll correct me, but like these these compositions now can can morph and turn into other lineups and wherever you want to take them, right? Absolutely, I I feel that completely. Yeah. yeah, they're just like conversation pieces and vehicles for us sharing something. Yeah. So you got the three mandolins. You got the Gilchrist. That was from Andrew Marlin. Got the Lord. Tell me about the other two. So Lawrence Smart, um, he built this. Uh, he built a couple of mandolas, I guess. And and I went out and did that festival. Uh, I think Grand Targi, and just about as he was finished, and 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 I had the um, good fortune of he he let me choose between a few, 
And it's like, I, I forget what letter you use when it's an A style and it's a mandola. I know it's not A, but <laughs> it's somebody an H? knows. What is it? <laughs> that might be. <laughs> it's, yeah, but, go ahead. <laughs> so, and and uh, actually, you know what's cool is I just bought a mandocello from him. So that's kind of exciting. Um, so there's, I'm just getting to know that. Uh, and I also don't know what the letter is for that. <laughs> that's a K. I know that. That's a K. All right. Good. So that's that's that. And then uh, Fletcher Brock, who must he's, he doesn't live very far away from you, right? Uh, Fletcher Brock is now based in Bellingham, Washington, which is about an hour to an hour twenty north of where I am. He's such a great builder, um, and and luckily for me, I, he he built this octave mandolin a few years ago, and it's been a real beautiful thing. I love the whole concept of like taking something that you know on one instrument and then going to another instrument where it sounds so distinctly different. And then the inspiration that comes to mind uh, can be really different when you play the same uh, interval or same little line on the mandolin and then move to the mandola or the octave mandolin. Mm -hmm. Um, It's, you know, they all kind of have this different uh, set of possibilities or, you know, maybe even emotional implications, I think. And then the mandocello seems like its own beast. Like, have you been able to kind of, make music out of that yet <laughs> yeah beast is probably the right word it's definitely unwieldy um although lawrence did a, built, built the great one and it's it's super playable it's just it's just so big you know um i think part of the the getting to know it uh process for me is about understanding what not to do again like okay this isn't really as doable here mm-hmm. and, and and knowing that ahead of time Oh, and also play. I play like, like all the time with this cello player, Mike Block, who who seems to have, um, you know, blown through any limitations. So I'm paying a lot more attention to when he ships, for example. Like that seems to be a much bigger priority uh, when you're playing an instrument with that scale length. So you got a cello mando cello duo in the making. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like we have to, right? <laughs> I guess. I don't think it's don't been done know. before. I don't think the world is demanding it, but <laughs> who knows? Maybe. Yeah, the other the other mandolin family instruments, I can see the crossover. The mando cello, just to me, I, I guess I just haven't heard it in enough settings where I've I've been able to understand like what it what it can bring to the table. I think that's true, and and I think a lot of them are are pretty difficult to play, and maybe that's part of it. Yeah. But like, you you know, I don't, I don't know if you've ever seen Mike Marshall's mando cello, but that's to me that's a spectacular instrument it's like um a race car in the in the best way like it's sensitive and responsive and and so to me that 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 shows that like there's some you know the instrument has lots of possibilities yeah when it's, you mentioned simon uh dunson did have you played electric mandolin i have a couple here actually and yeah. that's been really fun um i have one from joel eckhouse who's a builder here in town like as you know and then i took an old um Gibson, I guess H one, like mm-hmm. an old Gibson Mandola, and I think uh, I think it's called a Monkey on a Stick, one of these Diarmin pickups. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I put that on there, and I and I uh, kind of made turned it into a five string. Man, and it sounds great, and and that's been really fun. Uh, so I'm kind of I think Simon's gone way way further down the the path of exploring the possibilities with looping and and all these pet, pedals. Um, but yeah, I'm having a lot of fun with that. Uh, messing with the electric stuff. That sounds great. I mean, I'm sure each of these instruments brings out their own compositions and styles and totally. Next thing you know, you have a record. Totally. Absolutely. If you're listening, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. If you're listening to the instrument. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you're listening to yourself. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, what's the best way for folks to get this record Bandcamp? Bandcamp, uh, the record label is called Ade Ropa. I'm not sure actually how it's pronounced. I've only emailed with the, the, the uh, record label runner, but Ade Ropa, A-D-H-Y-A-R-O-P-A, records. How do you connect with them if you don't even yeah. know how to pronounce it? That's a good question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't even know why it's called that, but it's uh, uh, Joe Brent, who's a tremendous mandolin player okay. uh, in New York. And, and actually, he's. it seems like he's made space in his... Um, time in the record label for other mandolin players like he released Jolliffe's record okay and he's releasing Ethan Satiawan's record next in a couple of months so it's kind of become this place for 
um, interesting mandolin records. That is a really cool label. It's a great yeah. idea. Yeah. Um, and they, like I said, the, you can stream the record, you can get the vinyl, which is so cool. CDs, I think, still. Yep. It's great. Uh, it, it's, I mean, I know the year is young, but uh, one of the best mandolin records I've, I mean, one of the best records I've heard in a long time. So Thanks, congratulations. Man. I appreciate you listening. Uh, I'll include links to all the places you can check this thing out in the show notes. Um, Joe, thanks. This was great. Thanks thanks for making the time. I love what you do. Okay, that was my chat with Joe K. Walsh. Again, the album is called If Not Now Who. It's on all the streaming platforms. It's also on Bandcamp. Go check it out. Thank you, as always, to everybody who has listened to the podcast. I hope to see some of you. Uh, at the Fretboard Summit this coming August. I'll also be at Wintergrass here in uh, the greater Seattle area in February. And uh, who knows where else? So uh, stay tuned. Hope to see you. And uh, we'll be back next week with another podcast interview. Mm-hmm.